Hey everyone, this is going to serve as an intro lecture type thing for Merleau-Ponty's primacy of perception. So again, in our typical face-to-face -face class, I would start off our unit talking about Maurice Merleau-Ponty by giving you a little bit of history and then talking about how great he is and how much I love Merleau-Ponty. I did write a good chunk of my dissertation on Merleau-Ponty, so you just have to deal with a little bit of fanboying. Not too much, but a little bit of it. Um, but we're not reading my favorite book, possibly in all of philosophy, which is this one right here. It is the the phenomenology of perception. It's big. It's hefty. Um, you can use it to ward off intruders, that type of a thing. Um, but also, it is just uh, just a really fantastic thing to read um, and really influential in the way that I think um, and do stuff in the world. Um, and Merleau-Ponty was all about understanding how we do stuff, namely how our bodies move. Um, but uh, all of that aside, I'm just going to jump right into talking about this essay of Merleau-Ponty's giving you a little bit of that history, and then um, we can uh, talk about it in the discussion posts and things like that. Um, again, remember to turn in your questions so that I can uh, come up with some clever responses uh, to the questions that you have, and hopefully we'll be able to have a good um, mic. This headphone thing is getting in my way. Um, we'll be able to have a good uh, conversation about it. All right. So let's get started on Merleau-Ponty. Now, before World War II, Germany was the capital of European philosophy. It was the home of Husserl and Heidegger and Gadamer and critical theorists like Adorno and Horkheimer and Hannah Arendt and Walter Benjamin. And Germany was the fatherland to Kant and Hegel and Marx and Nietzsche. It's the home of phenomenology and existentialism and hermeneutics and critical theory and German idealism. It is, in many respects, a kingdom where philosophy reigned. But after the war... Germany lost its place as the global capital of philosophy, and in its place rose Paris. The city of lights, the city of the philosophes, would once more become the land where philosophy reigned. And in many respects, Paris is still where philosophy reigns. In post-World War II France, philosophers were celebrities. They were intellectual titans who espoused their ideas on every topic under the sun, and they were adored by a growing youth population, disaffected by both the war and by what some would call conformist societies. In the wake of such disaffection, philosophy in France became something as culturally relevant as the cin cinema, with uh, works by Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir and Albert Camus becoming international bestsellers. And they're perennial bestsellers, too. Um, then there's Merleau-Ponty. And Merleau-Ponty is the quiet one of that core group of French existentialists. He's also the one who, after philosophy in France exploded in productivity and influence, producing such towering intellectual figures as Foucault, Derrida, Barthes, Deleuze, Arigaray, and Kristeva, is still found to be incredibly relevant. What makes Merleau-Ponty relevant now is quite different from ma what made him relevant uh, at, in his time. Now, philosophers of mind praise him for his insight into what would become cognitive neuroscience and his prescience when it came to the importance of the body for theories of the mind. And aesthetic philosophers praise him for his erudition and his nuance when it comes to particularly focusing on painting and the work of folks like Cezanne, but also for his works in other areas of philosophy of art. And in the realm of the truly obscure, what one philosopher has said is popular only because it's on blogs, object-oriented philosophers praise Merleau-Ponty for his understanding that we are deeply connected to our world and to the objects we use in ways that we take for granted. Now, I'm not making any digs at object-oriented philosophy. I find it rather interesting, but um, 
it's just important to note that here that Merleau-Ponty is a philosopher who has been influential and continues to be influential in all of these different areas. In fact, one of the key areas that I think presently where his thought is extremely important and has a lot to say and resides kind of in the background with so many discussions is neuroscience and the science of cognition and how we learn. And so much of what Merleau Ponty did, because he had training in both the social sciences, particularly in uh, psychology and psychological experimentation, and also in philosophy, bridges the gap between those two areas, those two sort of traditions, the social scientific tradition of psychology, sociology, anthropology, and so on, and the more humanities-oriented traditions, things like philosophy, history, religion, etc. All right. What made, what made Merleau-Ponty an important thinker in France in his time was the way that he tra handled the transition between Hegel, Husserl, and Heidegger uh, into what, what Paul Ricoeur has called the three masters of suspicion, Nietzsche, Marx and Freud. Now, Merleau-Ponty was essential in bringing phenomenology as a practice to France, but he was far from the only thinker to do so. Paul Ricoeur and Emmanuel Levinas um, would, were definitely going to read at least one of those two, if not both, in the coming weeks, were instrumental. All three of them were instrumental in bringing Edmund Husserl's phenomenological method to France. But what makes Merleau-Ponty's contribution to French intellectual thought with regard to Husserl unique is that he actually went to Belgium and studied at the Husserl archives in Leuven, reading unpublished works of Husserl that offered a more nuanced and interesting Husserl than had previously been received in France. And so in like manner, Merleau-Ponty took the emphasis on history found in someone like Hegel and paired, the, paired it with the idea of being in the world found in Heidegger to produce a phenomenological account of human being that took into account not only history, but the importance of understanding our present situation or milieu in light of the past. Additionally, Merleau-Ponty's work incorporated the critical thought of Marx with Nietzschean elements, his thoughts on history in particular, to develop a historically oriented critical understanding of politics that attempted to keep its distance from any particular party, especially the Communist Party, which was the sort of intellectual darling of, of Parisian intellectual uh, circles at the time. Merleau-Ponty can be seen as a synthesizer of a number of philosophical streams while also incorporating new ones into his thought. This is not to say that Merleau-Ponty is unoriginal. Rather, it is to say that he is a master of organizing disparate ways of thinking into a coherent philosophy. Now, you might have noticed that I left Freud out of the picture when I described the other two masters of suspicion, Nietzsche and Marx. And I did this because Merleau-Ponty did not draw from Freud's psychoanalytic tradition when he took up work in psychology. For Merleau-Ponty, Gestalt philosophy, a theory whose central thesis is that the self-organizing mind perceives not objects and their qualities, but whole fields of meaning, along with elements of Piaget's developmental psychology. These are his main areas of influence. What Merleau-Ponty did with psychology in his time would be con considered today the interdisciplinary work uh, of cognitive neuroscience. So to sum it all up, we might say that what Merleau-Ponty was attempting to do in his work was to describe the complexity and nuance of human existence in all its places of entanglement in a way that's both poetic and rigorously empirical. Thus, the major works of uh, Merleau-Ponty, the phenomenology of perception and the visible and the invisible, are phenomenologically and philosophically rigorous 
and full of beautiful passages. Now we're going to turn to his address, the primacy of perception, and we'll see these two tendencies at work, the poetic and the rigorously philosophical, you can't see it because it's right in front of my, the, the poetic and the rigorous, there we go, rigorously philosophical uh, at work. So what I would like you to do is I want you to read the phenomenology, the primacy of perception, and then I'm going to talk a bit about different parts of that essay. Okay.